we can hang on. So we pray that as we continue to worship you this morning, that you come through this place in, with your presence. Give us the hope we need. Give us the peace we need. Give us the healing we need. We are desperate for you, God. We want to know you more. We want to feel your presence. So that's why we're here this morning. Speak to us. <clears throat> Change us from the inside out. This is our prayer this morning. We love you. We will worship you. We give you thanks. And all God's people say, Amen. How about if you have a seat, church?
Once again, as Pastor Mike says, good morning, saints. It's a blessing to be able to uh, share the word with you this morning. Um, Pastor Mike, as I said, was out. Uh, if you picked up one of the note guides on the way in, just save it till next week, because um, <laughs> I'm not preaching his sermon. Uh, we won't be in Luke today. We're going to be actually in Mark chapter 5. Before we do that, uh, our church is going through together uh, the New City Catechism, um, basically just a, a way of, of learning truths uh, from week to week. And so we're going to look at the, uh, the question and the answer for uh, this week. Um, if the slide comes up, it's, and I don't have this. Uh, how and why did God create us? And the answer being, there we go. God created us male and female in his own image to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. So that's the, the reading for this week, and there's more in the, in the book, and I uh, encourage you to, to read through that. Before we open the word together, I'd just like to pray. Our Lord Jesus, once again, we come to you to open your holy word. I thank you for the time that we're able to share in worship together, singing before you, singing to you, being reminded of your truth, and I pray now that as we continue in worship, that your Holy Spirit uh, would speak to us, would use your word in our lives to change us, to make, you, to make us more and more like you for your glory. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Have you ever asked God for something and he doesn't give you the answer that you wanted? And maybe just completely unexpected, or he said, well, not yet, but wait, and, or maybe you see him working in somebody else's life, or some situation around you, or circumstances around you, and you're kind of scratching your head, and you think, God, did you, did you really do that? Is that the way it's supposed to be? 
Um, I'll be honest, sometimes I read through scripture and I look at an example and I think, Lord, wait, what did, did, is that really what you intended to do? Um, today we're going to look at a situation where uh, Jesus acts in a way that at first glance would seem, for me personally, to kind of, I'd be scratching my head and say, God, why did you do that? Uh, we're going to look at, at Mark chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20. Uh, the verses that are, that are on the screen or that are on, on your screen if you're watching online, uh, typically we use the English Standard Version here at church. Uh, I personally read from the New American Standard Bible, and so that's what I have for the verses today. If, if it looks a little bit different, a few words different uh, as you're reading. But I encourage you to, to use your Bible or use your phone, or you can look on the screen. Um, in Mark 5, uh, I'll read from verse 1 to 20. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him any more, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, day, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Jesus had, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby in the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine, so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, of the, coming out the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had been the legion, who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine, and they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him, and he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim at Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. This is quite a story. It's quite an event. If you're new to our church or if you're watching online and, and are not familiar with our church, our church interprets the Bible literally. We believe that what God's word says is what really happened. So when it says Jesus got into a boat, it means he got into a wooden boat. And he crossed a lake, it means he physically crossed a body of water. And these things that happened about demons mean that real things with real demons happened. Um, just starting in verse 1, uh, we'll start to look at it. <clears throat> Excuse me, it says, They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. So where did this take place? Well, the other side of the sea, the sea being the Sea of Galilee. Really, it's a big lake, but it's referred to as the Sea of Galilee. Galilee is in the northern area of Palestine. It's where Jesus grew up and had his ministry and, and where much of his ministry took place. And when it says they came to the other side of the sea, it's because they had been on the east side, I'm sorry, on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, and they crossed over to the east side. If we jump back a little bit in Mark chapter 4, in verse 35... It says, on that day when evening came, he, Jesus, said to them, let us go over to the other side, meaning the other side of the lake. So they went from the west side to the east side. Why is that important? Well, the west side was Jewish area. It was Galilee, where, Jew where Jesus grew up. The east side was Gentile. They weren't Jewish. Now, was there some mixing between? I'm sure there was commerce between them and mixing in different things, but they were different people groups and different, different traditions, different families. 
And so Jesus had traveled over to this Gentile area, and he's confronted with this man. What type of man is this that came to Jesus? In verse 2, it says, When he, Jesus, got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Interestingly, on the side, if you read through Mark, he used that word immediately, right, or right away, in many instances. Mark is a, is a gospel that is one of action. He keeps things, keeps things moving, and, 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 and this is what happened. Immediately, he got out of the, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. What's an unclean spirit? It's a demonic spirit. The spirit world is real. There are angels, which are spirits that God created and that choose to serve and honor God, and there are demons, which are spirits that at some point in history in the past chose to disobey and turn away and rebel against God, led by Satan, and they do everything in their power to destroy anything that honors God. And I believe anything, nature, people, animals, whatever, and we'll see that in, as, we, as we go along. But the spirits are real, and the demons are real. They were real back long before Jesus came on the earth, they're real in Jesus' day. They're real today. And they still are active today in various ways. What else do we know about this man? In verse 3, it says, And he had his dwelling among the tombs. So he lived in a cemetery. Now think about that for a second. Let that settle in. He lived in a cemetery. He wasn't with his family. He wasn't on the outskirts of town. He didn't have a shack somewhere in a cave or something, or near a cave. He lived in a cemetery. And he had extreme strength. It says, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Which tells me that people tried to bind him with chains. We see his, his actions, how he ran around, how he shouted and yelled, and acted in self-destructive ways. And so at some point, people, his family members, friends, neighbors, somebody, maybe just out of self-protection, had tried to tie him up with chains. What was it like to be that man? To be not in control of your own actions and your own mind and your own spirit, but to have people tie you up with chains and be bound that way. What was it like for those that did the work? Maybe there were some who had grown up with this guy or who knew him or knew the family. And at some point they realized, he's dangerous, and we have to do something about this. And they didn't kill him. Maybe they tried to. Who knows? But they bound him with chains. And yet, that wasn't enough. Because it says in verse 4, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Wow. The demons controlled this man so much that they used his physical strength to break these chains apart on multiple occasions. And so what he did in verse 5, it says, Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. So there's this guy out there living in the cemetery, running around night and day, day and night, yelling and screaming. Maybe words, maybe just sounds, whatever. And he would take rocks and stones and hurt himself because the demons were controlling him and they wanted to destroy him because he was made in God's image as we just read in the catechism. What was it like to be one of those townspeople nearby and to know there's somebody out there and he's dangerous and I don't know what to do to protect myself or my family or my possessions. My kids come to me and they say, Mommy, Daddy, what, why does that man do that? Is he going to come and get me at night? I'm scared. And what do you tell your little boy or girl? When you, when you buy some livestock and you make the purchase and it's for your future and your family and your... your you're living, and you don't know if that guy's going to go in and try to take it or steal it or kill it or whatever because he's not acting in his right mind. And what an atmosphere of fear that that would create. 
What fears do we face today? What fears are going on in your life? Is it in your marriage? Is it a rebellious child? Is it fear about COVID? Is it fears about something political? Is it fears about whatever? And do you come to the point where I don't, I don't know what the answer is? I don't know what to say. When your teenager comes to you and says, Dad, I want to keep doing school online because I don't want to go back there because they bully me at school. And if I'm online, I won't be, have to be in their presence. And you don't know what to tell them. Or your spouse comes to you, and maybe it isn't a surprise, but after a while they say, look, really, I've had enough. Okay, I'm moving out. I'm done. And you've tried, and you're praying, and you're hoping, you realize you have your own mistakes, and, but you don't know what to do. Or the bills are coming. And your work and your business and your job has gone downhill because of the last 10 months, and you don't know how to pay those bills. God is greater than our fears. And the fears are real, and God doesn't dismiss them. But he is greater than those, as we sang about and as we're going to see in his word. So Jesus cuts out of the boat, and here's this guy, and he comes up to him, and he's yelling, and he's screaming, and he's, he's super strong, and he's just whacked out. And I wonder, what, it was, what was it like to be one of the disciples that was with Jesus at the time? Okay? I don't want to put something in scripture that's not there, but I think we can kind of uh, uh, think about the situation. If we turn back one chapter to Mark chapter 4, in verse 1, the disciples that were with Jesus, and maybe it's the 12, or maybe there's a few more, or a couple less, or whatever, but there were those that traveled with Jesus, and in Mark chapter 4 and verse 1, when Jesus is back before he goes to, to the Gerasenes, he says, he began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into the boat in the sea, sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. So Jesus is in this area, and he starts to teach, and people start coming around. And more people come, and he's kind of backing up, and he's backing up, and his feet get wet. And he backs up, and his ankles are wet. And then the water's up to his knees, and finally he says, okay, this is enough. I'm getting in a boat. And we're going to back up a little bit so that the people are here, and they're not crowding us so much. And they get in the boat, and there's these crowds of people, and you're one of Jesus' disciples. And you're like, wow, this is great. This is amazing. This teaching is wonderful, it's from God, and these people are responding to it. And isn't this just great? And you're, you're part of it, and it's wonderful. If we jump ahead in Mark chapter 4 uh, to verse 35, <clears throat> excuse me, 36, it says, Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, just as he was and other boats were with him. So leaving the crowd, so there had been these crowds, was it dozens of people? Was it hundreds of people? Was it thousands of people? It doesn't say exactly. In some ways, it doesn't really matter. It was something enough, big enough to call it a crowd. And you're with Jesus, and this is exciting, and this is great, and all this is going on. And you go across the lake, and you get there, and you're met with this guy that you've never seen anybody like it before. And you kind of maybe wonder, what is going on? I thought this following Jesus stuff and being with him meant happy times and big crowds and excitement. And now I face this, and I don't know what, quite what it is. Well, that's where the disciples were. If we go back to Mark chapter 5, and starting in verse 6, it says, Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. Who was in control of this man? Was he rationally making these decisions, or was it the demons? This is the part where you can answer back. <laughs> the demon. Thank you. So the demons were controlling the man, so why did he bow down? They're against Jesus, right? They want to destroy whatever glorifies him. Because even the demons are subject to Jesus and they know it. If we turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. And it says, For this reason also God highly exalted him, highly exalted Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who's under the earth? The dead or the demons? 
They will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day they will do it, not willingly maybe, not in a way to acknowledge his salvation for their spirits, but they will still acknowledge Jesus is Lord. Jesus said when he went, just before he ascended, all authority has been given to me. Jesus is Lord even over the demons. And I believe that's why this man bowed down. We go back to Mark chapter 5. What's going on here? In verse 7, it says, And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. So this man wasn't just speaking with Jesus. He was shouting at him. He was yelling. It was that type of setting, that type of conversation. And there's the interchange of, of what goes on, and, and I'm not going to get into all the, the details of angelology and all those kinds of things. There's others who know a lot more about that than I do. But if we jump down to verse 12, the demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. In verse 13, Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. So what was the demon's request? To go from occupying one man to occupying 2,000 pigs. And it says when Jesus asked them their name and they said legion, legion was about 10,000. A legion of the Roman army was 10,000 soldiers. So 10,000 demons were in one guy? That's what the word indicates. Yeah. So they went from one guy to 2,000 pigs. Can demons occupy animals? Well, I guess so. This is an example of it. And they drown. They were destroyed. And I think it tells us a little bit about the work of the enemy and what he does is that he destroys. Satan destroys. Sin destroys. He seeks to do that in all his activity. To destroy anything that glorifies God. If we turn over to John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, Jesus is speaking and he said, So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, all those who came before me, who came before him, I would say the Pharisees, the traditionalists, the ones in power, those that led people astray from God. He says, they came to steal and kill and destroy, which is what the demonic legions and Satan himself seeks to do. They were trying to destroy this man. They did destroy these pigs. That's what Satan's about. Look back in Mark chapter 5. This man was self-destructive. He gashed himself with stones. These demons act in a way to destroy the pigs. And so you've got these guys who are caring for these pigs. Now 2,000 pigs is, is quite a bit. I, I, even though I grew up in Iowa, I never lived on a farm. Um, but we have a lot of pork and pigs around here. And I have a little bit of stuff with it and 2,000 pigs is a decent sized farm in what I understand. Some are bigger, some are much smaller. Um, how would they have a farm that big in that kind of area? Well I wonder if it was like a community herd. Maybe it was from the one village or even a few villages around and they were all kind of put them together for economic purposes of being able to sell more at one time or something and, and so there's these guys who are hired to take care of them and all of a sudden these pigs Something happens, they run down the hill and go into the lake and they drown. So the guys run off to tell their boss, hey, wait, this is what happened. In verse 14, it says, their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, told everybody, and the people came to see what had happened. I'm sure they did. Did they know about what Jesus had been doing with this man? I don't know. We don't know how far away these pigs were. If they're only 100 yards away, maybe they heard the man screaming. Maybe they heard Jesus responding to him. Maybe they didn't. But they saw the pigs drown. So they went and told people about it. 
and the people came. In verse 15, it says, they came, the, the people from the village and, and the area, they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very men who had had the legion, and they became frightened. What frightened them? The fact that the pigs ran and drowned? No. They were frightened that this man was sitting and was in his right mind. It doesn't even say they were glad, and I don't think they were. They were frightened. Does God's work ever frighten you? Do you see him act in a certain way and you think, wait, Lord, that, that's not what I expected. That, that wasn't on my agenda. I, I raised my child hoping that they would have a good income and good future and stuff, and now they tell me they want to go into ministry. Or they want to use their artistic gifts that God has given them to do something that doesn't pay the bills. God, what are you doing? Or, God, wait, I, I, I thought I was going to stay in this job a long time, and now I don't have it. And I know I see you showing me a couple opportunities here, but that wasn't my plan, God, and I'm scared. These people were frightened. Because God was acting in a way that they didn't expect. They had figured out a way to arrange things with this crazy guy around. And now, the crazy guy isn't there anymore. And they were frightened. So what do they do? In verse 16, those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine in Mark 5, 17, and they began to implore him to leave the region. They began to implore him to leave the region. Now think about this. Jesus, the Son of God, comes in the flesh to your neighborhood and does something, and you ask him to leave. You don't just ask him to. You beg him to. Jesus, don't stay around here. What a tragedy. Wow. God shows up and they're not ready for him. And they're not only not ready for him, he's not welcome. Do we ever do that? Do we ever have our times and, 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 and uh, like Pastor Mike's sermon last week telling us about how we're entrusted with the gospel and can we be sharing that with others? And maybe this week we were praying about, Lord, is there somebody you want me to share this with? And that kind of opportunity comes up with that neighbor or that coworker and the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you could say something here about my work in your life. You could, you could talk here. Oh, wait, 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 no, Lord, I wasn't thinking of them. I, you don't want me to talk to them about my faith. Do you really? I mean, that wouldn't be comfortable. Sometimes God puts us in situations that we don't expect, but that's where he wants us to act. These people didn't expect Jesus to heal this guy, and so when he did, they asked him to leave. Going on in Matthew, or Mark 5, verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. So how did this guy respond? He had been saved, he had been healed, he had been radically changed by Jesus, and he knew it, and he says, Lord, okay, can I come with you? How would you respond? If you're in Jesus' place. Hey, can I come with you? Sure. This will be great. This will be wonderful for Jesus' ministry because here's a man and he can tell his story to these crowds that are going to come. And Hey, you wouldn't believe what I used to be and Jesus healed me and he helped me and Jesus had this great opportunity. So of course Jesus is going to let him into the boat and say, come with me. Right? Verse 19 of Mark 5. And he did not let him. What? Wait a minute. Hold on just a second. Jesus is wanting to make disciples, is wanting to, to people to hear the word and hear the truth, and here's a guy who has a great story to tell and wants to come along with him, and Jesus says, no. That's not the way to grow a church. That's not what the, all the experts say. That's not, I mean... But Jesus knew. And... He didn't only tell him not to, but if we keep reading, and he did not let him, 
But he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Wait, you want me to go where? No, Jesus, wait, you, you, don't, you don't understand. Those chains that are laying there, they're the ones that put them on me. They're the ones that were scared of me. Have you ever had somebody scared of you? Have you ever acted in such a way that you lash out in anger? Or you just don't forgive? Or you're bitter? And somebody in your life you hurt. And they don't want to be around you anymore. And Jesus says, yeah, you need to go talk to them about what I did for you. Why is it so hard to share the love of Christ and the word of Christ with those who know us best? Because they're the ones who know us best. They know our hypocrisies. They know our faults. They know our issues. And we don't want to come across as some holier than thou that we have all the answers and, and Jesus doesn't want us to either. But he does want us to share with them. And so he tells this guy to do that. And in verse 20, and he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. So where did he go? Decapolis. What's that? Well, Decapolis is an area of ten cities. Deca, meaning ten. In the Greek, like a decathlon in the Olympics is the ten events. Decapolis is an area of ten cities, and it's a Gentile area where this man was from. Why does that make any difference? Well, if we jump ahead a little bit, Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, verses 31 and 32. It says, again, he went out from the region of Tyre, meaning Jesus, and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Why did they do that? They're Gentiles. Jesus hadn't spent time around there. Had word gotten there? Maybe so. What I think, and it's not an original idea with me, I'm sorry, I don't remember where I read this, but I think that this guy who had been in the tombs did what Jesus told him, and he went back to his family, and they heard the word, so that the next time this Jewish rabbi came through town, they knew he could heal people. And the word spread. And spread so much, if we look at Mark chapter 8, verse 1, in those days when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples. And he fed them. Fed thousands of them. Well, why was there a large crowd? Could it be because of this guy and the spark that God lit through him in that area to grow and grow and grow? Makes me wonder, what if Jesus had let him in the boat? Would this deaf guy have gone through life, the rest of life, deaf? Would the crowds never have heard? What if we're not willing to go where God wants us to and talk to whom God wants us to? Will he still reach them? Maybe he will. But we miss out on being part of his plan with that. So I, I think we can ask ourselves this morning, who are we most like in this story, in these different characters? An interesting thing here is sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers. There's different entities in this story who ask things of Jesus. The demons ask Jesus, can we do this? He said yes. The townspeople ask Jesus, will you please leave us? He said yes. The man who knew Jesus personally and who was willing to follow him asked Jesus, can I go with you? And he said, no. Why does God tell us no sometimes? I think because he has a better plan in mind. I had a professor named Dr. Dr. Bill Thrasher uh, who used to say, God's will is what we would want if we had all the facts. Every time. We can't see all that God is doing, but that's what we would want. So who are we most like? Are we like maybe the, the herdsmen who saw God doing something over there 
and kind of freaked you out, and you're like, I'm just going to stay away from this. I don't want anything to do with this. I don't quite understand that. It doesn't fit my paradigm. Or we like the townspeople, where we've been through difficulties. We've been through hard things. We've been scared. But we've got life under control. I'm able to manage. I'm able to fix this if things just don't get too crazy. And the Lord shows up. Instead of saying, Lord, I'll follow you, we say, no, I'm going to stick with my plan. God, I, that's, that's too much that you're asking of me. I can't go. Or we'd be like the man and say, Lord, I need you. I've been chained. I've been bound. You set me free. I will do whatever you ask. Because you're asking. I'd like to read a couple pages from a book. On Wednesday night, we just started a class here at church called Raising a Modern Day Night. And it's a helping fathers raise their sons. And the author is Robert Lewis. And he's a man who was a, leads a men's ministry and is a pastor. And he has an interesting story that what happens when God does the impossible? Impossible in quotes. But at least the unexpected. <clears throat> Excuse me. By the way, just to explain a little bit, he was raised in a family with an alcoholic father who was verbally abusive. I don't know if he was physically or not, but, but he wasn't raised in a Christian home. But he came to Christ in college, and I'll pick up the story there. Robert Lewis says, I was pastoring a church in Tucson, Arizona, and on one particular night, a group of friends and I were talking about the power of prayer in our small group. We raised the question, what is one thing you want to trust God for but you think it's absolutely impossible. For me, the answer was clear. For my father to receive Christ as his Savior. He had already rejected that invitation several times. Nevertheless, people took it upon themselves to pray that night that something would happen in my father's life, life to cause him to see his need for Christ. That very night, back in Louisiana, my father was in a drunken state at home. He and my mother were yelling at each other, when he announced that he was going to leave and drive someplace. This was their typical pattern, yell and leave. However, what happened next was not typical at all. Mom, seeking to keep Dad from driving drunk, grabbed him by the arm, trying to hold him back. With a powerful shrug, he brushed her away and stormed out the door. Little did he know that when he pushed her, she tripped and fell backward, her head hit the edge of a marble coffee table, knocking a telephone on the floor and breaking her neck. She lay there for several hours until an operator came onto the line. Mom was able to tell the operator what happened, and soon an ambulance rushed her to the hospital. She would lay in traction with pins protruding from her skull to stabilize her spine for 10 weeks. Dad stayed out all night and went straight to work the next morning. When friends found him there, they told him what had happened. One can only imagine the guilt that exploded within my dad at this awful announcement. He responded by suffering a heart attack on the spot. Another ambulance, another trip to the hospital. When word of all this reached me the next day in Arizona, I immediately caught a plane and flew back to Ruston. When I walked into my father's hospital room, I had no idea what to say. Dad was groggy from the medication, and, soon I and I soon realized he didn't know who I was. He thought I was a doctor. I asked how he was doing, and all I could say was, I've done a horrible thing. For several minutes, he painfully recounted the events of the last 24 hours. Suddenly, he began to reminisce about his three sons and what each was doing. When he talked about me, he talked about what a good son I was and how I was a pastor of this big church. He exaggerated a bit, out in Tucson. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. After all those years of deafening silence, I finally was receiving from him a special moment of love and approval I had always longed for. He didn't know he was talking to me, but I realized that the Lord had arranged those circumstances to allow me to receive this special blessing from my father. As we continued talking, Dad began to realize who I was. With tears, he confessed, I've done a horrible thing. I need to go to hell. Here was a man who had ignored God for many years 
And finally, he saw his need. I didn't even think before I replied, Dad, there is a judgment, but there is also a thing called forgiveness in Christ. For a solid hour, I talked to him about the gospel and how he could receive forgiveness of his sins. And at the age of 70, Thomas Lewis finally found his Savior. The impossible had happened within a single day of the asking. It's an amazing story. God can do the impossible. He can save an alcoholic at 70 years old who comes to him. He can save a man who has lived in chains in a cemetery controlled by demons. And he can save us. Where do we want to live? If you haven't come to a point, a time in your life in the past when you've recognized your need for Jesus to save you because you know how bad you are inside, then I would love to talk with you after the service. Love to walk you through that. Our pastors and those on staff and our elders would be willing to talk to you. If, you, if you're online, you want to contact us and, and we would love to have that opportunity. Or maybe you have come to that point in the past and, and yet you need to talk to somebody else about some other things. We're certainly willing to talk with you and to pray. But I would at least invite you to consider, Lord, where do you want me to go this week, this month, today? Who do you want me to call? Who do you want me to chat with, send an email, a text, whatever? And say, hey, you know, this is what Jesus did for me. Has he ever done that for you? If you're feeling bound with chains and you don't know where to go, Jesus can free you. He wants to. He's powerful to. And he can. Let him do it. Why don't we close in a word of prayer? Our Lord Jesus, I praise and glorify your name for the power that we see in this account from Mark chapter 5 of how you saved this man and how you later seems used him to further your ministry and your kingdom. And Lord, I've never been bound with physical chains, but I've been bound by spiritual ones. And I've felt that way emotionally. And I have hurt others. And yet, Lord, you're here to grant us that freedom. You want us to acknowledge you as our Savior and Lord and let, us you, rule our, let you rule our lives so that you can set us free and so that we can know that fullness of life that we read about. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would continue to be glorified in us and through us and use us in whatever ways you want to. And we ask this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone, what is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hands. What comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which I stand. Come on, church, let's stand up, let's sing it together. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we come.
hopelessness, Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? Oh, sing. God is good. God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? Holds of faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy sky, who sends the waves that bring us high unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing. Hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we see? Christ he lives, Christ he lives, and what reward? Everlasting life with Him, and we will rise to meet the Lord, and sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Say, oh, say. Christ, our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Can you sing? Oh, sing hallelujah. Let's sing. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Amen. He is our hope. Thanks for joining with us this morning here or online. Uh, if you're new to our church and you would like to learn more about it, uh, Jane Christensen, our missions director, will be over here in the guest reception. Uh, be happy to meet you and talk with you some. Um, feel free to contact us. I'll be down front if you'd like to talk or pray. Go with God and have a good week.